Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of such novels as Touch Your Nose and Jacoby Street and founder of Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another wonderful episode of the Right Project Podcast. I know I say that they are all wonderful, but this one really is. Everyone, you are in for a treat. Ladies, men, we are here with Jason Normoor, the the Hi. god of love himself, the wonderful human being on the planet, uh, the thing from which all creation was birthed, Jason Normoor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I be more hyperbolic in my talk? I go, no, I'm going to uh, undo myself every episode. Jason, thank you for joining us on the Right Project. Dude, that, I want to be introduced with that much hype all of the time. I felt, it made me instantly think of that image of like uh, that, that idea of God speaking and the sun came out of his mouth. It made me yep. feel like I could speak and the sun came out of my mouth. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm everyone's hype man. Um, wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, to do proper introduction, uh, Jason Normore is the current youth advocate for the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and yeah. Labrador or depending on when this airs, Writers NL. Uh, uh, they're in the middle of that kind of transition period right now. Uh, yeah. And biology, he's also a poet with uh, spoken word poetry. Is that correct? Or like goes with, I don't, it's not an organization that one goes with, but you, you do things with the spoken word, correct? Yes, definitely, definitely. I've def- I've hung out with them before and I've had the chance to do readings. I, I kind of love poetry for the audible uh, aspect of it like I love the writing but the yeah the spoken element to it is something that I'm quite intrigued by too so yeah poetry is crazy let's talk about some of your stuff there but like the the yeah. poetry as an experience is I, I, I love poetry I've got a whole wall of it here next to me but it's yeah. it's different when spoken it's it's not oh, yeah. a same at all uh, I can Poetry is one of the rare things where I'm like, no, no, this it's sad during the pandemic because you need to have readings of poetry. I've never bought a poetry yeah. book where I didn't go hear the poet speak it and then go, oh, man, I've got to get that book. Man, yeah, it's like, you know, I had heard someone like a few years ago talk about, you know, they were talking about poetry and this guy was a poet himself. And he was kind of like, I mean, you know what it's like in any world, whether it's literary or music or art, like you feel this need to like know what you're talking about, whether it's like someone could bring up this author and I could comment on this and that and just know all things. He was like, he's like, man, forget that. He was like, find like one or two poets or three poets you really love and like get to know their voice. Right. Like, cause that's what happens. Is yeah. that exactly that's oh yeah it, that's my one caroline duffy yeah yeah big yeah. time there you go and it just is getting to know their voice over a long course of time like i was thinking about that before we talked like i love writers who have passed kind of like we all do because you have this chance to see like the shape of their whole lives and how their voice developed and grow and changed throughout it so yeah that's cool man yeah yeah that's cool um i also uh this is good People are going to see how the, the, the thing is made, but if you, the sausage is made here, but if you're ever in an event or anything like that, and someone brings up an author you've never heard of, and you don't want to sound, look like dumb, just, yeah. just say that you, the trick is to say that you have read their work and you really <laughs> liked how like they wove in the theme of man's inhumanity towards man into it. <laughs> um, because that's a theme in every book ever. So mm-hmm. you, you'll sound really smart. <laughs> Our inhumanity towards each other. Yeah. No yeah. taken. Yeah. I know you're making me look at my own work differently. I'm like, is that what I write about all the time? I guess yeah. so. <laughs> it's every, every, everyone, every author ever. That's the joke is that that is always a theme to the point where I've gotten very good marks on essays at Mun for books I have not read and did not know the synopsis of based on I reframed the question in the essay. And then just said it's about man's and humanity more. So I learned the name of the main <laughs> character from the question on that essay and still did good. <laughs> you just exposed mine. 
<laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. On one radio. Um but oh nice. I think poetry in essence is hopefully always humanizing. Hey, like I think that's oh, what yeah. I love about it. Like it's such a yeah, it's hard for it not. You know when poetry is not humanizing, you're kind of like, I'm walking away from this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and I, I like all poetry, but there's definitely like um a, a, a breed of poetry that I shy away from like it's all it's all wonderful but there is a certain certain type of poetry that and it all like you said exposes humanity and stuff like that because we're the authors and we're human and stuff like that uh i call it nature poetry where it's it's you know just focused on like oh the beauty of a spring day and that still says something about humanity because it's a human writing it like i said but there's definitely a part of me that prefers that laser focus on the human condition i'm gonna zoom in on one moment in time and just yeah. kind of share that experience kind of thing. Man, I love, I, I have one of my neighbors back in, I was living in Toronto before moving back to St. John's and during the pandemic, we'd all hang out. And, you know, you talk about everything and I don't know, we were drinking together one night, poetry came up and he was like, I was like, yeah, I just don't even know how to define poetry. And it was this kind of like Zen moment where he was like, he's like, poetry is like taking a single moment in time and letting it breathe. And I was yep. like, oh my God, I love that so much. That narrowing in and just kind of unfolding the world out of it. So good. Man. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm much less artful in mind where it's like my, like poetry <laughs> Poetry is like uh, a ball of spaghetti that you've nice. dumped out of the bowl onto the floor. And yeah. what that's the poem. And what you're doing when you're writing it is you're spreading it out so that you can see every oh, individual. Nice. You, it's not a ball anymore. You're going to spread it out and see every individual strand of spaghetti. Oh, there's like a, like when you stretch a fabric, right? You start to see the threads. Yeah, cool. I'll remember that imagery. I'll steal that. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. You are extremely active in the community right now. I'm seeing you just everywhere and getting involved in everything. Like I said, you're involved in Wannell. I've been seeing you at events and stuff like that. You are the face kind of thing. What's what's Ow! driving you? What's driving you that? Like what's what's what what lights a fire under you? Because you've got a fire under you. So what's a fire? What what lights it? Oh man, I love you. You're so observant. I can't even handle it. I feel so seen. Uh, <laughs> um, man. Real talk, like yeah, so. Yeah. I lived, I lived in St. John's a few years ago, and it was under really different circumstances. So I used to be, uh, I used to be a pastor, and that I know, I know, dude. And honestly, man, it's like so hard for me to talk about because, like, I, not that I don't want to talk about it, but just finding language to talk about it. Like I've since walked away from like pastoring and from, you know, uh, Christianity as we know it kind of in our culture, like I've stepped away from a lot at all. But, um, but the cool thing when I was here, like I, I had the chance to start a new community in, in the city. And so I was working a lot with, you know, I always wanted to make a church that was like, A, like really friggin' rad, but also that um, was actually a space for uh, like people who weren't, welcomed in other spots. And so what I mean by that, like a huge part of our community was LGBTQ and, and it was really just so special in St. John's because so much of the Christian kind of religious scene here is so conservative, narrow minded and really closed up. There's not a lot of space for that kind of stuff here, especially not like there is in other cities. And so I saw great things happen, but it got, it got really so it was kind of dualistic. Like it was really beautiful. There was this kind of really cool thing happening. Uh, but then it was just so bad because I just was confronted by, uh, oh my God, like the amount of like hate mail I had written to me from like pastors across Newfoundland and like other church organizations. And in the end, I ended up getting like screwed over by this organization I was working for and they like plotted getting me fired. And it was like, it was literally like a teenage novel of the religious flavor and mean girls, but for the the patronage. Oh man. Like Lindsay Lohan would be intimidated by the drama they can cause. It was crazy. So, you know, but the hard thing was like through that, Matt, like I just became so depressed, man. Like I was like, full transparency like I was ready to kill myself like it was so dude it was so dark because it was so intimate right like created this thing and it was special to other people and blah 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 
And so moved away to Toronto again for a while, found my way luckily out of church work eventually. And, you know, I was getting out of like a really serious relationship and, and kind of that whole, on top of the pandemic, you know how these like moments of suffering have a way of refining what we really care about or what we want to do in life. And so I was working in film up there and I remember going to work every day and just seeing what was possible. Like when people worked their ass off all the time, they wanted to create something and tell a story and share something. And I just had another one of these like kind of revelation moments of, oh my God, like I, 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 I still care about the things I care about. Like I really love St. John's. I really love Newfoundland. I really love the culture here. And I think, uh, you know, Newfoundland for all it's good also has like a, you know, we can just close ourselves in. We can hide. Oh, yeah. feel like there's not a world beyond here. Right. Or you couldn't possibly create the artist's life or chase it or do something new because, you know, we're, we're in St. John's. There's like, you know, there's a small scene and, but I knew I wanted to come back and I, and I had a lot of stories I wanted to tell. So before I moved back down here, I wrote a full record. And so I moved to Winterton to record this record with my friend. I finished writing my first poetry manuscript and I'm kind of just like diving into stealing back a lot of my life that was stolen from me. And so you're really catching me this on like this kind of like, kind of this like new empowerment, this new, like comfortable confidence in myself. And hopefully not in like an ego, like look at what I can do, but more of like a, I'm just so really friggin' grateful to be alive and I'm going to like create and tell stories and tell other people's stories. And I'm not going to stop. Like, I don't want to do anything else. I want to live. So it's a, that's why I'm like, if there's certain things that line up with what I really care about right now, like I'm so invigorated and passionate to be involved in the creative scene of our city yeah it's awesome. consuming me. yeah yeah no and you you don't seem egotistical at all honestly it's it's awesome um yeah that that is crazy that is crazy. yeah the, the, <laughs> the um that's a cool story that's a novel in and of itself that's a that's a that's that's the hero's journey man you're you're done the uh-huh. hero's journey you you started somewhere <laughs> you wanted something you went looking for it you you adapted you went through all these trials and tributations you got what you wanted but there was a heavy price to it because it turns out the uh-huh. price wasn't good for you and now you've returned where you started having change like you just yeah. went through uh-huh. the hero's journey I'm going to, oh, I'm going to listen back and steal that. I've tried to write this like a book on that a hundred times, but it, I think it's still so intimate that it's hard to yeah articulate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You almost got to be, to write your own story, you almost got to be, you've, you've almost got to be separated enough from it in time that it's become a story in your head. Like everything does eventually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Like everything does eventually. Yeah, yeah. In the end, we're all stories. There really is no... The past and the future are human constructions. All that exists is right now. Really, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like, I can't prove that the world didn't start 10 minutes before the beginning of this phone call. I, I can't. There's yeah. no way to prove that. And that we, weren't, <laughs> that, that we all weren't just born with the memories that we have currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Which it's got it's, existential on a Tuesday morning. Oh, yeah, no, I love explaining that to uh, children. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Your story is really powerful, man. Like that's that's crazy. I always knew I liked it, but that's there's some power behind that. So that's um, it's really dangerous. I find when like not just one organization or anything like that, like what happened with yeah. you, but when any organization kind of sets it up as the be all end all, and there's it's not something within you, it's something yeah. within them. Like like when that's your whole thing and there's someone else in charge of it that can be turned against you you know what i mean like what what happens when the thing you've devoted your life to turns around and says actually you're not cool and turns itself against you like uh, like of course it would drive you to do dark things you know what i mean oh my well even like you know especially the role of religion right because it's like you know, every, I guess all institutions have a religious flavor to them by the nature of being part of something, but there's something to kind of like growing up. And this is me like post a lot of therapy and a lot of processing this, but there's something to, 
you know, religion that so intimately gets in the fabric of who you are, like, so, like this, it kind of can really instill this, like, uh, this really specific or narrow worldview about who you are, about who your friends are. Like it just, it kind of detaches you from what's really going on in the world. And you're just more afraid of like, is Jesus going to pop out of the clouds at any minute? So, <laughs> but it's intimate. Out of the clouds, out of the clouds. I like that. That's, uh, that, 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 and that kind of reveals, like you, you said that as a joke, but it's, it's very revealing. I have, I, I, uh, I have nothing against any religion, any anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very much a uh, agnostic on the side of atheist kind of thing. I'm just like whatever. I'm focused on my writing. Like I I, yeah. I don't have time to think about big picture stuff <laughs> like that. And I yeah. I get kind of like I get kind of tweaked when people ask me. But there are um, because I'm like who cares? Be quiet. I'm busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. um, there's uh, a quote from Ricky Gervais I really like uh, where yeah. he's, he's much more militant about this stuff than I am, but he, um, it is some, some level of, if they made you not teach religion, if they made people not teach religion until you were like 14, 15, until your brain had started to finish developing, even 2025, 20, it might stop existing because like so much of it is predicated on, getting in young like when you said like oh jesus is gonna pop out of the clouds that's a that's a kid's idea of what that yeah. is and so much of it gets in young when our when you're young pre-five your brain is programmed to just accept whatever it's given like you you yeah you can't explain to a four-year-old why they can't touch the hot thing because yeah. if if their brain questioned it like our brains do now they yeah. would die they would touch the hot <laughs> thing and then they would die so, so <laughs> we evolved so that we don't question things before the age of six. And that's when yeah. we, we get belief structures in there. So it's like, it's yeah. these things like I'm mom, I am dad, gravity goes up uh, and also God's real. And it's like, uh, what? Yeah. Not, not all of those are, are certainties like you painted them to be. So one of these things Which is not, like, not the like the other. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh man. Totally. Yeah. And then what, what happens, right? Like in the human, well, it's like anything, right? Like you, you know, if you practice the piano enough, you become a pianist, you practice listening enough, you become a listener. You, you go. And you practice these religions. And again, not to bash religions, but as an example, like you're going to become that. And then what happens when a day comes and you want to step away from it? Like that's such that's an interesting trick. thing right now. Like there's so, I feel like there's such a movement at like kind of in the like, you know, this digital renaissance we're living through where people are kind of like, how do we just get the heck away from what we inherited to be true? And you on? know what? And to take it away from religion, just so that we're not like yeah. bashing on yeah, that institution. Yeah, no, 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 no. But like, we stay on topic, but bring it away from that. I, I think every institution, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a religion. I don't care if it's the Writers Alliance. I don't care what it is. But there's this thing. Institutions can't have feelings. And and when they do, yeah. things start to get weird. Because, like, you were part of something. And then when you decided to leave it, which is your right, you can change your mind, yeah. whatever. You could leave the Writers Alliance right now. And no one would be like, ooh, gross. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. But when you choose to leave it, that should just be your choice. Like you're allowed to change, you're allowed to grow, you're allowed to alter your priorities. But there, whenever an institution is big enough that somehow that institution gets to have human feelings, like uh, you have hurt yeah. that institution's feelings by leaving, there's an issue. Yeah, we've, what is it? We like bled some line or something. Hey, this, let it become something it was not intended to be yeah it's almost like um it's interesting because it's it's very much like corporate personhood you know what i mean that that yeah. thing of like in in the states and all over that's happening where it's like no uh an institution can be a person and so can deny some people entry or can deny some people their basic rights because uh they are right they're a person too and they have rights i'm like i'm sorry chick-fil-a is not a person <laughs> like do people say that do they try to like, oh yeah humanize? really yeah corporate wow. personhood that's a thing that's a thing that it's called where a lot of corporations argue that they are people with 
human rights like the right to free speech. And so they can't be sued for what they say and do and the actions they take. There's no way I'm not writing a poem today called Corporate Personhood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the, the gross thing about corporate personhood is, I, by and large, like, not to, like, throw out everything, but, like, when I, whenever a, in my experience, whenever a corporation is claiming personhood, it is to deny a person personhood every time. Man, that is, man, that's a Wow. To deny, hey, sorry, I, that's just, I'm going to have to really think about that, Matt. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is wonderful. I, this is definitely going to, I've been thinking about starting a sub-series on the channel called, like, Write Project Biographies, uh, where oh, I just nice. zoom in on, like, on author instead of the work, like, instead of having someone yeah. on to promote, like, I'm talking to the author about their, their who they are. This is definitely yeah. the first episode of that. This is a good, this was a good <laughs> excuse. <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah that's yeah happy awesome day. blossom you are an yeah. encouraging food man i mean you've always we've only known of each other for a month or two and you've always been so kind so thank you oh yeah yeah no no i like everyone i like i like people's work i like people who are passionate that's the yeah. thing man. i like people who are, are dialed in i'm like all right like yeah. let's 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 get eyes on this people like like totally yeah yeah and, and I, 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 people are passionate about their work, I think should be able to live off it like I can. And it's to me, it's my job to get as many eyes on another passionate person as possible so that they find their audience, even if that audience isn't me. You know what I mean? It's like using your own platform to give others a platform. Hey, yeah, yeah. Big time. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks for yeah, some, me. Yeah, I know. People did it for me. So, yeah. What is the most difficult part of your artistic process? Oh, dude, the most art, ah, the most difficult thing, man, and it's something I've been thinking about recently, is like, is becoming comfortable with your own voice, especially in poetry. It's funny, man. It becomes like a, it's become like a catalog for like watching my own self-development, like, so much so I was reading, like yesterday I sat down with some poems I wrote, even just like a couple of years ago. And you almost get this like, you know, at the moment they're like, man, these poems are amazing. Like way to go, like really stepping in my own. And then I'm like reading them now and I'm like, oh, I was so reserved and close in and so unconfident of my own voice. So it's kind of, I think the most difficult thing is just trusting yeah, the way I articulate things, trusting my thoughts on it and not like not feeling ashamed of how I think or how I perceive things or my, and my like eagerness or passion about something. It's for whatever reason, I, it's so writing can either be the most opening and an expressive thing I can do in life or it can make me feel so small. It can make me feel so inadequate. And it's maybe I like the torture of it. I don't know, but it's hard to navigate sometimes. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 fair. Um yeah. I think it should feel feel make you feel small in some ways. I it's not that it's torture. It's that like there's there's there can be an ego trap to 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 writers. Uh, and and it's a good reminder to remember that the the work is what's important, not you. In some ways, you know what I mean. Like yeah. when you're reading your work, you should feel small because that means the work feels big. Wow, you, yeah, wow, that's a cool thought too, man. Yeah, Jason Normor, this is a very serious question. This is very serious. I will take none of your 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 guff on this question. No guff coming. <laughs> if you were a jam, what kind of jam would you be? Oh my God, I would be some sort of perfect blend between Leonard Cohen and Gord Downey. Like there would have to be some sort of like Canadian sweet, like sexy, poetic, kind of like stoner, majestic, mystical, flirting with Fleetwood Mac combination of events happening. And that's okay. who I would okay. be. Okay, so you're not, you're not... You're not doing a jam as in like raspberry or strawberry. You're saying the corpses of these individuals are being ground into oh, mulch and okay. put in a jar. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. Call, yeah, that's call. Yeah, one hundred percent. I didn't think okay. of jam. I thought of music instantly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's Leaving fun. it in. Don't clarify. <laughs> that's amazing. 
um, there'll just be an episode where everyone's picking out like their different flavor of jam, and you're like, yeah, squish up these humans into a jar. <laughs> Gord Downey, yes. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, 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 perfect. Okay, when you say flirting with Fleetwood Mac, do you mean that your personality is, or do you mean that, you know, you're flirting with Fleetwood Mac behind stage, you know? Oh, my God. If I could flirt with Fleetwood Mac in like in like a romantic way, yes, absolutely. But, yeah, I came into Fleetwood Mac. You know, I've been like a rock and roll guy my whole life and playing in bands and stuff. But it was only like these past few months somebody was like, have you listened to Rumors? And I was like, no, oh, not really. And it's been this like the deep dive into kind of like the dark mystical energy of like Stevie Nicks and them as they're doing stuff. It's just captivated this part of me that I didn't know needed captivating. Oh God, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> hey, uh, I, uh, I have a friend who's very, very into music. Uh, yeah. She was on the one board herself for a while and, uh, and uh, Alicia Morrissey. Uh, she is my musical like teacher kind of thing. Nice. Um, but like awesome. my, my, my Jedi master in the art of music, but she was at my wedding a few months ago and, uh, and uh, my, my wife danced with her dad to uh, the, the, the Stevie Nicks song, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the landslide. And um, Alicia yeah. just immediately like broke down and then like turned to the rest of the crowd and was like, all right, you're playing Stevie Nicks. I'm glad I brought this and reaches into her purse and pulls out like a 40 of whiskey and start passing it around to everyone to like, like to, to soothe their aches from listening to Stevie Nicks. Oh God, that is, see, this is what I'm talking about. I would flirt with them in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. Oh um, my um, Jason Normore. Oh, hey, wait, let's finish this off. Let's finish this off. What yeah, yeah. flavor of jam would you be? We're leaving all that in because that's all wonderful. But like what yeah. if you, you know, with berries, fruit, that kind of jam, what kind of jam would you be? Got it. You know, yeah, man, I, I've not typically been a big jam person, but my most recent memory of jam was somebody came over and they just brought me a bottle of homemade strawberry jam. And I can still remember just the delightfulness of like the crunchy strawberry seeds while I was eating it. And yep. I don't know, I was invigorated by the texture. So it might be just like a normal take, but give me some strawberry jam, put it on some delicious homemade bread and I'm living a good day, I would say. Uh, yeah, leave it to a poet to be like, uh, to not talk about the taste, but the texture, to examine another <laughs> section of it. You know what I mean? Oh, it's the te- it's just like crunchy peanut butter man I the like sound that. now your sound well there's just something to the when food can become like a layered uh, sensory experience who doesn't yeah. love that yep yep <laughs> uh jason normore if you could tell your younger writing self any one thing what would it be be unapologetic just write and write and write and write and write and say it all like and don't feel the pressure that you have to show everybody or that you need to like put it out there just like explore your own voice and just let it be terrible and then let it be amazing and be comfortable that's something I really had to start owning last year was just like especially when I was starting to write a lot more music like I've written a hundred songs that are really bad ones that I would never share. And I've written a zillion poems that I would never show anybody. But I, uh, you know, you feel this pressure when you're young to kind of produce something like I'm going to be a prod, like a prodigy, I promise. And I think it just kind of, uh, I definitely let it uh, probably become like, I think fear was in my way a lot. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin and didn't really have a place to do that. So I would have uh, just told myself to like, spend some time alone and give yourself a hug. You're you're a fun person. You know what you're doing. You got this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You are a fun person. You do got this. Yeah, yeah. I like it. (laughs) Yeah. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for coming on the Right Project podcast. You can check out their work as a part of the Writers Alliance and join the youth committee. If you're so motivated, you can check his work out at Spoken Word events, and I'm sure in print all over the world soon. 
<laughs> thank, thank you for coming on the Right Project podcast, Jason. Thank you, Matt. You're the sweetest ball of energy ever, man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's nice that people see. I feel seen. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Perfect. <laughs>